Hey, thank you so much for checking out today's video. I'm Pastor Matt, this is Pastor Adrian, and we pray this message blesses you and encourages you all throughout your week. Absolutely. For any more information on how to be praying with us or to become a part of our community or to give, please head on over to takeovergr.com. As you're giving, would you stand for just a moment? Kelsey in the booth, if you can kill the lights for me. Everyone just begin to fix your eyes on Jesus. I firmly believe the Lord is trying to get our attention, trying to get our attention this morning. And I'm wrecked. I'm wrecked by the fact that the King of the universe, our Jesus, my Jesus, feels like he has to make attempts to get our, my, your attention this morning. And so we're just gonna take a minute before we go any further because the most pastoral, apostolic, Christian, Jesus following thing that I can do, that we can do in this moment is to seek him until we found him. We do not go further until we go with him, amen? So Jesus, 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 just begin to lift up the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, Jesus, 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 we love you. We love you, Lamb of God. Oh, Jesus, 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 oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, firstborn among the dead. Holy, holy, holy forevermore. God, you don't have to bend our arm. We're here. We're here for you, God. We live. We live for you, God. We long. We long for you, God. You are. You are our priority. You are our destination. You are our journey. You are our life, Lord Jesus, God. Lord, this morning, we're sorry if we've grieved you. Lord Jesus, we're sorry if we have not paid attention to you, if we've given everything else in this room, and even those outside of this room, more attention and affection than we have to King Jesus this morning, then we repent, God. And right now, we as Takeover Church, we turn again to being a home for you. Jesus, we love you, we love you, we love you. Lord, if you don't come in this room, we labor in vain. Let the train of your robe fill the temple. God, when your train of your robe enters the temple, every heart, every head, every eye, every ear is inclined, is turned, is repositioned to bask, to look, to marinate, to be found in and want to be a part of your glory. Yeah, pray in tongues. Lift up a prayer to your heavenly Father. Right now, Jesus, we just say it doesn't matter who's here or who's not here. We recognize that you're here and you are the chief authority of our lives. You are the prize of our lives. You are the darling of heaven and the darling of Takeover Church. We exist for one name and one name alone. And it is certainly not Pastor Matt. It is certainly the high priest, Jesus. Yes, yes Lord. Yes, you are. We love you. We love you. Thank you for being in our midst. Take these next moments, Lord. Realign your bride. I don't know the week we've had, God, but what I know, Lord, is we need a repositioning towards you, Lord. May you never have to look in this room for faith. May you always simply find it. In Jesus' my name, a faith-filled church, praise them like nobody's ever heard before. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. You may be seated.
Thank you, Miss Kayla. Amazing worship leader, Kayla. Can you give it up for Kayla? Oh, yeah, lights and come back, all the good stuff. Thank you. Oh. <sighs> may we never, 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 Lord, may we never simply just click that religious checkbox. Takeover church is not something that you attend. Takeover church is what you are. Because Jesus came to take over people's lives. There are enough homes, and I love them, God bless them. There are enough homes in our city that Jesus has found taking part in. There will be one for sure that he takes over, amen? That will be our home. Oh, well, if I haven't had a chance to meet you yet, Pastor Matt, my awesome wife and I, we have the pleasure of leading this uh, wild move of God that uh, loves to stomp on hell's nest and uh, give God all the glory while doing it. Amen? That's what we do here. That's what we do here. Come on. We have not found a pit of vipers that we have not took delight in smashing. So that is what we are going to do this morning. Oh, man. But yes, welcome. What an amazing time in his presence. And uh, if you feel like I kind of gave out a spiritual spanking, I did. And that's okay. That's okay. God rebukes those he loves. God disciplines those he loves. He is a good father. Okay? It's all good. This is great. We're growing together. We got to quit looking at confrontation and correction as negative. If it makes me look more like Jesus and it makes me look more at Jesus, then I'll take it. Come on, somebody. Preaching to anybody this morning. Now let's get after it. Like many have said, and I just want to acknowledge briefly, we are a team and a bunch of our key volunteers. We had an amazing opportunity to go and be a part of our sister church's conference. We are a part of something called the Radiant Network, which is amazing. And our goal as a network is to have a thousand praying churches throughout the United States of America. And so we got to come together and we got to learn about that and be more equipped in that. And if you don't know, we do have a 6 a.m. on Friday morning prayer meeting every single week here at Takeover Church and uh, probably more coming soon, but we'll talk more about that later. But I do want to get that on your radar. And uh, man, it was an amazing time. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for praying alongside of us. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for interceding on our behalf that we would grow in the knowledge and revelation of Jesus Christ. I believe we have. I believe we are continuing to do so. And I believe we have come back with a massive kingdom of heaven sized chip on our shoulder to see Jesus radically shift, take over, and change not just Grand Rapids, but this here entire region. Amen? Amen. Man, I, I think a lot of pastors, I think a lot of churches, I think a lot of Christians, we live our lives for a lot of things, and often one of them actually is not Jesus and his chief concern to see fire upon the earth, aka a burning people, a burning bride, a burning body, someone worthy of the remnant of God that he is going to come back for. This church, this house, you and me, this is what we have pledged our lives for, amen? So this morning we are continuing to steward the prophetic word over this house for this year called Fire Upon the Earth coming out of Luke 12, 49. If you're new with us this morning, we've been doing it all year. We'll keep doing it all year. And I cannot wait. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. I cannot wait to see who you and I are. The Holy Spirit heavyweights, the Holy Spirit wrecking balls for the kingdom of heaven. I cannot wait to see who you and I are come January 2024. We are taking an entire year to steward one word, one goal, one chief concern of heaven to be a burning people. I don't know a whole lot of other places that do that, but we are. It's our call. It's who we are. We're not better than. We're just called different than, and it is what it is. So get on board, get with it, and let's see God do something through it. Amen? But I'm not a rapper. Title of my message this morning for fire upon the earth, I think it's week 18. Somebody, yeah, see, but Easter, Easter was kind of like a adjacent thing because it's Easter, so I do think it is week 18. Uh, no, because also Good Friday was a little bit of adjacent. Anyways, you know what? If you look on the podcast, I, if there's doubles, I'll, I'll own this, but I'm pretty sure it's 18. Anyways, if someone doubled up, needless to say, title of my message is Living Before a Throne of Fire. 
living before a throne of fire. Living before a throne of fire. And would you just turn and ask your neighbor, what throne are you living before? What throne are you living before? Ask your second choice neighbor, what does your life say you are living before? What kind of throne does your life say you are living before? Coming out of the book of Revelation still in this last little bit, the Lord gave me a specific word for our house in this hour. And he said, you want to see a bride on fire? You preach the last lessons of Jesus. And so we went through the very last chapters of the book of John. And then he brought us to the book of Revelation. And I got to say, I said it last week, I'm going to say it this week. I truly believe this has taken us to new depths in the Lord. And I just want to keep swimming. I just want to keep going out. I just want to keep seeing how far out we can get together. Amen. And if you feel like you're getting lost, grab a hold of someone else, grab a hold of a buddy, a friend, and let's swim there together, amen? Don't get lost and don't give up simply because something is over your head. That's when God begins to do his best work in our lives, amen? Come on, come on. I got to tell you, there was a time, oh shoot, there was a time, friends, in the church where mysteries weren't problematic. There was a time in the church where mysteries were not problematic, they were romantic. There was a time in the church history when mysteries from God were not found as problematic, they were found as romantic. They drew us deeper into him. They took us out farther with him. The mysteries began to entice us and bring us in and say, I want to spend time with God all the more. Instead, today, mysteries are found as problematic. And so instead of building upon the faith that we do have, we find ourselves slowly descending off the small little fake faith that we possessed and then we completely abandon him mystery with God is always always called to be romantic if we see it as problematic friends we have got the wrong view of Jesus we have got the wrong view of Jesus he says it is the glory of kings no it's to the glory of God to conceal a matter it is to the glory of kings to search it out He loves to hide things, not to tease us, but to bring us in closer. Do I understand everything in the book of Revelations? Absolutely not. Am I committed to understanding all of the things in the book of Revelation? Absolutely not. What I am committed to is going further and further with him. Amen. Revelation 4, if you're there, say I'm there. It'll be up on the Sky Bible this week. It's a smaller chunk, 1 through 11. There's only 11 verses in this one, so we're going to mouth this down. We're going to get all the meat off the bone, and we're going to say, thank you, Jesus. May I have another? Amen? Amen? Come on, Revelations 4. Here we go. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here. Come up here, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit, and behold, somebody say behold. Behold, the throne stood in the heaven with one seated on the throne, and he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and of Carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. Seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns upon their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven and spirits of God and before the throne there was as it, it as it were a sea of glass like crystal and around the throne on each side of the throne are four living creatures full of eyes in the front and behind, and the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature like the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them had six wings and are full of eyes all around and within, the stuff that gives you nightmares. And day and night, they never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And church said, 
And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders, they all fall down before him who is seated on the throne and they worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord God, to receive glory, honor, and power for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Amen. 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 Come on. Don't make me bring back the mantras. I'll get you talking. I'll get you talking. We will be. We will be. be. That was last summer. Church was about 30 people. Don't worry about it. came back in my worst behavior. All right, let's pray. We're going to get into it. Amen. Father God, we love you. Father, we love you. We love you. We love you. God, right now we say it is the splendor of our lives, God. It is the sweetness of our lives, God. It is the greatest tasting thing of our lives, God. The most accomplishment we will ever ascend to, attend to, be a part of, and be brought into, God, is not what we do outside of this room. It is not the things that we have created or accrued for ourselves, God. It is not the levels that we can climb in our job or the money that we can have or the houses that we can build or the places that we can go and the faces that we'll see, God. No, the highest splendor of our lives, God, is that we are counted as sons and daughters of yours. Lord, 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 you are the highest honor of our lives. Thank you for that precious blood of Jesus that redeemed my life from the pits, God, that took me, Lord, from being an abused little boy to probably growing up to be an abusive little man. But you took me from the pits, God, like you took everyone in this room and you lifted us up and you seated us in heavenly places next to Jesus so we don't have to live in the generational curses that come from our fathers and our mothers sin but no we get to live from the throne of heaven seated next to Jesus who was next to you Holy Spirit come Holy Spirit come remind us right now God of your preciousness remind us right now God of who you are remind us right now God of who we are to you God remind us Lord give us a deeper revelation of the things of God We came for one thing and one thing only this morning. That is to first and foremost minister and worship to you. Second and third and fourth and fifth and one thousandth God is to become more like you and less like us. So Holy Spirit come accomplish your great task this morning of turning a Matt McClure into a Jesus Christ. We love you. Amen. Church said. Amen. Come on. Let's get it. Living before a throne of fire. Living before a throne of fire. Like threes living before a throne of fire. Oh, man, I love the book of Revelation. I love the book of Revelation. Literally, I got saved 17 years ago, and the first dang book that I read of that here Bible was the book of Revelation. Good decision? I think so. We'll find out. I was kind of a wild child. I was kind of wild when I met Jesus. I was, I was a lot more ratchet before I was righteous. You know what I'm saying? Like, it took me a while, and Revelation didn't help, okay? Revelation didn't help. I was like, there's dragons! You got to understand, I took a lighter and I, t- I tried to light a kid on fire. I was like, heaven or hell, heaven or hell, heaven or hell. It was bad. It was bad. I got kicked out of PE. Uh, it was bad. It was in the locker room. It's a whole thing. Anyways, uh, so I was on fire. I was trying to literally set other people on fire. Don't do that. However, that's not the book of Revelation's fault. That is the fact that I had a radical conversion with Jesus and I had no idea what to do afterwards. So if you're wondering if it's still in effect, it's still in effect. And... Uh, now I have a church to take it out on, which is great. So it's going to be good. But I love the book of Revelations because we've been pointing this out every week. But every time I point out, the Lord takes me into a little bit more of a revelation of the book of Revelation than I even had last week. And it's amazing because, friends, a lot of us, we live with an improper view, an improper alignment, an improper revelation of the book of Revelation itself. You see, friends, so many of us, we mistake the book of Revelation is not a revelation of the end times. It's a revelation of the best times. Uh, Pastor Matt, you said you read it? Yes. It is not a revelation of the end times. It is a revelation of the best times because while the book of Revelations may prophetically speak about in part the end times, the book of Revelation prophetically speaks in totality about the return of the king. End times in part 
return of the king in totality. Are you picking up what I'm laying down? Return of the king eclipses the end of it all. Well, Pastor Matt, I just don't like reading it. I want just good news. Friends, there is no better news than the return of Jesus. There is no better news than the return of Jesus. Well, Pastor, if that's true, then, then how does the return of Jesus and the knowledge of that and the revelation of that, how does any of this help me have a better marriage? I've committed adultery. How does this help? Because you will begin to love your spouse, love your marriage, love your life because you live in reverent awe that one day Jesus is coming back for you. In what condition, what position, and what kind of place do you want you and your spouse and your marriage and your legacy to be found in? Well, Pastor Matt, that sounds scary. It is. That's okay. Because even David, who was one of the biggest sinners in the Bible, was a man after God's own heart. And he said in a psalm, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. If the king of the universe only gives you lovey-dovey goosebumps but doesn't strike fear up your spine, friends, we don't know the same Jesus. He's both. We just love to sing about God's love rather than sing songs about God's wrath, but both are equally important to who he is. I appreciate anybody this morning. We love to sing about his grace, but friends, I can tell you his justice is just as important to who he is. I appreciate anybody this morning. The book of Revelation, friends, if you have an out of an alignment view of the book of Revelations, all of us, we are going to live through the end times. But if you have an out of alignment view of the book of Revelations, you will live through the end times, but you will live through it in fear. But if you have an in an in alignment view of the book of Revelations. You will not live the end times and live it through fear. You will live in the end times and you will live through it in faith. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? The book is good. The ending is good. The things that don't make sense are good. I promise you, God says, I am good. That means all of his ways, even those we don't understand, those we can't comprehend, and those that we want to think are harsh. Friends, if you think God is harsh, you need a deeper revelation of Jesus. God is not harsh. God is holy. I think the problem we run into when we begin to read the book of Revelation is that we got a little bridezilla going on as the bride of Christ where we think the wedding day is all about us. And when the bride thinks the wedding day is all about her, she thinks her ways, her thoughts, her knowledge, her feelings, her desires trump her bridegroom's feelings, wants, ideas, and desires. And friends, I can tell you this. We've got to kill Bridezilla. We've got to bring her down because this wedding day that you and I are going to attend it is far less about his bride and far more about her bridegroom. I'm not preaching to anybody this morning. It's about him. It's going to remain about him. It's always going to be about him. And when bride begins to think that she is more kind than the Christ, we are out of alignment. I preach to anybody this morning. You are not more kind than Jesus. I am not more kind than Jesus. I don't have better ideas than Jesus. You don't have better ideas than Jesus. We don't have a better evangelism plan than Jesus. He has the best evangelism plan. Well, we just don't talk about demons in our church. Jesus did. Preaching to anybody this morning. Preaching to anybody this morning. We are doing a spiritual spine alignment in the bride this morning because we are walking around at half mass, bent over, crippled by what we've allowed the church to, to become. And Jesus is saying, no, stand up tall. Come on, woman. I'm coming back for a burning bride who looks far more like me and less like she does right now. Get strong. Get some steel in your spine. The days are dark and I am coming for you. Preaching to anybody this morning. 
I love the book of Revelation because it is Jesus' self-described, hear me, and his self-prescribed revelation of himself. He not only describes himself to you and I, but this is the ultimate prescription of who he is for you and I in our lives. The bride is sick. I have a prescription for her. It's called the book of Revelation. I'm not preaching to anybody this morning. If you're sick, I have a word for you this morning. I have a prescription for you. I have the medicine. It's called the book of Revelation. I love this book because it is absolutely bananarama. But it takes us to places and it causes us to trust him outside of our own knowledge and understanding. And again, like King David said, I lean not on my own understanding. This is the church. We will not figure him out this side of heaven. We are only invited into deeper places with him this side of heaven. I'm not preaching to anybody. So speaking of deeper places with him, I loved last week. I loved Revelation 3. And I could spend an entire year there alone. It's so good. I love it. It is my favorite meal to to just come around, but I'm telling you, Revelation 4 might take the cake because Revelation 3, it ends with Jesus telling John, again, this is John the apostle. This is John who was boiled in oil in front of 80,000 people by uh, Caesar named Domitian in the middle of Rome because he was messing things up and because he refused to die. Because he refused to die. He was banished to an island called Padmos to serve out the rest of his life on a rock-crushing prison colony alone. Yeah, context matters. The Bible matters. We need this thing. You see, he gets this vision from heaven. And one of the things that I've been harping on is the fact that John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. And we've been talking about how it ends Number three ended with Jesus saying to John, he that has an ear, he that has an ear, singular, while he was on ministry on the earth in his 30s, he said what? He that has ears, let him hear. And then as we got closer to the end times, it speaks to his intimacy with us. And he says, he that has an ear, and that was John who had an ear because he was found with his head on the chest of Jesus. Recap good? And so it ends and he says to John, he says, he that has an ear, Let him hear what the Spirit of God is speaking to the church. And then all of a sudden, John hears a rumble and he hears a voice like a trumpet saying, come up here. Come up here. Come up here. And I love this part. I love this part because friends, have you ever heard that verse that says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared in his heart for man. Have you heard this verse? Do you know what I'm talking about? This is the moment where we get deeper revelation of that there verse. This is the moment where God begins to open it up to the earth and say, this is the moment where I let you in a little bit. Because suddenly, We go from heaven's view of the earth as Jesus was correcting and cheering on churches in the book of Revelation 3. So we go from heaven's view of the earth and we turn and we go to heaven's view of heaven. All of a sudden, from John's point of view, both his eyes now have seen, now his ears, they have begun to hear and heaven turns inward And we begin to get a deep revelation of what heaven wants us to know about itself. And Jesus says to John, come up here, come up here, come up here. And John, he turns around and he sees a door from heaven, a standing door from heaven. It is open and a voice like trumpets calls out to him, says, come up here and I will show you What must happen after this? What must take place after this? And we have got to pause right there because there is so much oil in that one sentence. 
First and foremost, I would like to submit to you today the call of the church has been the same call of the church since this moment with John, and it has been come up here. Come up here. This has been Jesus' standing invitation as the door is standing wide open. Jesus, in this moment, began his intercessory, his intercession, his open heaven, his thin place ministry above the churches where heaven begins to invade earth and he touches down in the midst of humans again and the miraculous take place and it is easy and it is light. This is the moment. This is the moment where piercing the veil became available to every single one of us. I would like to submit to you that Jesus isn't opening something specific in this moment to John and John alone, but I believe it is a prophetic door that is open to every single believer, every single church, every single bride in the earth. The problem is the bride of Christ today has very little interest in living before a throne of fire. We have very little interest in living before a throne of fire. Pastor Matt, why is that? Because living before a throne of fire will demand absolutely everything from you. It will demand everything from you. He is an all-consuming fire. There is nothing in this life once Jesus Christ has taken ownership of your life that you get to keep to yourself. Everything, therefore, written in the blood-bought contract of Jesus Christ on the cross for your life. He doesn't have a lease. He has sole ownership. He doesn't just have a lease on your sexuality in your 20s. He has sole ownership of your sexuality your entire life. He doesn't just have a lease on your marriage when you're first getting started or before you're going through premarital counseling. No, 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 he has sole ownership of your marriage, sole ownership of your, of your fiance, soon to be wedded season. I say that because I understand that we have young people in our church and they decide that they wanna do what they want instead of what God wants. Thank you to the older saints in the room, the seasoned saints, who have prepared a way for us to run down of obedience. We acknowledge you and we love you. And we praise God for you. Old men for wisdom, David said, young men for war. We believe that here. We don't want to live before a throne on fire because a throne on fire demands all of our attention, all of our affection. It demands every single thing in our life be moved in alignment and in obedience towards what the one seated on the throne declares. And so we have left this. We have left this open invitation of the standing door to heaven where Jesus is crying out to his bride, come up here. You see, we are found today as a bride and we're going, no, Jesus, come back down here. Won't you return, God? When are you going to come back down here? When are you going to come back down here? When are you going to come back down here? And Jesus is still on his throne going, I have plans to come back down here, but I'm only coming back down there for a bride who has once come up here. Preach to anybody this morning. He has plans to come back down here, but he will only come back down here for that remnant burning bride from Luke 12, 49 that has lived and answered the call of God on her life to come up here, to come up here. See, friends, <laughs> friends, there is a level of freedom that you and I, we have forsaken this side of heaven that is absolutely in totality available to you and I right here, right now, as I live and breathe before you, but we have forsaken it because we have decided that we would rather worship a throne of convenience than a throne of fire. We would rather worship a throne of comfort than a throne of fire. 
You see, we want a Jesus that we can understand. And so we have reverse engineered the church in 2023 and we have built a church in our image and likeness. We sing songs in our image and likeness. We have a Jesus that looks far more like us than the Jesus of the Bible does. We have done a great disservice to the Gen Z that's coming up behind us because we have stripped back Jesus into a mere man, into what you and I can obtain in our own strength without him. When I've got to tell you, friends, the call of God on your life and my life isn't what you're naturally good at. It's a call to die so that he can live. Preach to anybody this morning. We have told a generation, you're called, rise up. And then we send them into the marketplace and we go, what are you naturally talented at? Can I tell you, sometimes your natural talents line up with what God has called you to do but vocation and ministry are almost always different. Almost always different. I would love it if every Levi under the sun who truly loves God, who wants to worship him, who wants to welcome him in on the praises of our people as we come in, I would love it if every single Levi actually got paid for their job because that is literally the most significant role for a Christian in this hour is to raise up Levites who are pure in heart and are standing at the door ready to usher in the Lord to meet with his people. Instead, what we are doing is platforming, paying thousands of thousands of dollars, renting out auditoriums and stadiums all across our nation and our world. And we are platforming people and we are calling them worship leaders who are completely undiscipled, but they can sure sing good. On this side of heaven, we can try our best to manufacture his presence, but it's only when a church decides to come up here that we will begin to manifest his presence. You see, this is an open heaven. This is a standing door, an open invitation. You want to know how I know that? Because nowhere in the book of Revelation after this does it say Jesus closed that door. John goes up, door stayed open. John goes up, Door stays open. There is a place with Christ this side of earth, this side of heaven, this side of eternity, friends, where heaven longs to invade this space. But unfortunately, the church is rarely found sharing in that same longing of heaven because we want a safe church and a safe service and a safe Christ. It's only within the last couple hundred of years that the church was ever deemed a safe place. It's only the last couple hundred of years that services were deemed safe. And I guess it's probably because we kicked the Holy Spirit out and we decided to stop letting him do what he does. It's only the last number of years that all of a sudden Jesus became safe. Jesus makes me feel so safe. I'm glad he makes you feel safe because he puts my sin on notice. And when I see him, I realize I have got some, I have got some things to lay down. <laughs> I've got some places I need to start believing him more in. I've got some areas in me that are still in desperate need of the redemptive work of Christ to be led in on. Jesus. He opens the heavens to his bride. And yet, we're good with this. We're good with this. Come up here. Come up here, he says. Come up here. Friends, there is an area of heaven that is readily available to you and I as his bride today in 2023. We don't have to wait till we die. We don't have to wait for him to return. We don't have to wait for the end of all things to walk through that very open door. It is available to us now. Problem is most of us have decided we can live without it. That's why we don't play church here. That's why I don't pull punches. 
That's why we read the Bible and we affirm the Bible. That's why we don't bend to the whims of culture. That's why we call men, men, and we call women, women. We call sin wrong. We call Jesus good. We do not bend and we do not whimper and we will not run. It's not because we're mean. It is because we are a people who have met Jesus, who spend time with Jesus and have decided that he will not just be the darling of heaven that we sing about, but he will be the darling of heaven that we live about. I'm not preaching to anybody this morning. Come up here. Friends, what is happening in this moment is Jesus is welcoming his bride through the lens of John into a further of a place of intimacy with him. He is saying, come up here. There's a place up here where you and I, we can be intimate. Where you and I, we can go further than we've ever gone. I can take you to places and truths in me that you have never seen, that you have never heard. And I will begin to tell you things about you, about me, about you, show you things about me, show you things about you. We can go further further up here than we can down there. But you see, most Christians, we bend and we whimper to culture because it's cold and dark. And yet Jesus stands at this door that is an open heaven. And he says, you don't have to fight from a place of defense in a cold, dark world down there. You can live from a throne of offense that is a fire from up here. I preached to anybody this morning. You see, he says, come up here. And he's introducing this level of intimacy to his bride. He's saying, come up here. Intimacy, intimacy into me, you see. Into me, you see. Intimacy. He is inviting us. He is opening it up. He is opening the door. He is pulling the veil back and he is saying, come up here and see into me. Come up in here and let me see into you. Come up here and let us labor and reason together what it looks like to pursue all things through life and godliness that's been made available in Christ Jesus. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? He is saying, into me you see. Come up here. It is a place of intimacy that will begin to unravel everything that you are and reveal everything that he is. I'm not preaching to anybody this morning. This is this area that you and I, we have been invited up into, into me, you see. Come up here. Come up here and see into me. See into me and break through the bondage. See into me and cast out all the shame. See into me and break off the chains of religion. See into me and break off the chains of your past. See into me and break up with your future. See into me and make me your all. See into me and leave the bondage and smog of this world that you have been shrouded in and living in a chain to. And see into me. Into me, you see. See, friends. Here at Takeover Church, we, we're sold out to this. We're sold out to this standing door. We're sold out to this. And I want to ask you, friends, what does your intimate life look like with God? What does your intimate life look like with God? What does it look like? Do you come to God in prayer? And do you come to him with this shopping list of things you wish to receive or is Jesus himself intimacy with him is he reward enough is he reward enough what reward do you seek in intimacy what is it about him that you want from him is it simply his things or is it him is it his gifts or is it the gift giver Because friends, I got to tell you, the gifts come with the giver, but the giver has to be our lover. Are you a lover of the Christ or are you a lover of the Christ's things? Are you a lover of the Christ or are you a lover of the Christ's things? Friends, I'm telling you, cotton candy Christianity is dead. Sugar daddy Jesus has never existed. There is one Christ. He is not your side piece or your side chick or your side hustle. He is the darling of heaven and he should be the darling of our lives. Into me, you see. You and I, we have been welcomed in 
to the most intimate place with the most intimate being of all time. And for what? $20 tip in the offering container and a couple hours service on a Sunday? Are you kidding me? Is this the grand plan of the redemptive work of Christ or is there more? And if there's more, where do we find it? Up here, up here, up here. See friends, we're sold out to this. And I got to tell you, I'm going to lay out a challenge right now. Brief challenge. Sound good? Matt, this whole thing's been challenging. Good. Me too. Challenge. Every single Friday morning here at Takeover Church, we have a 6 a.m. prayer meeting. I'm laying out the challenge right now. You want to grow in intimacy with the Lord? Give up one Friday morning and be here. Well, Pastor Matt, you got, I got work and I got kids and I've got all this stuff. And maybe you actually have a realistic responsibility that is impossible right now for you to move and push aside to be here one Friday a month. So maybe you have to attend online. However, that is the exception, not the rule, my friend. The challenge to you is this. What would your life begin to look like? What would your life begin to look like when you decided I'm going to stop putting on a pedestal the pleasure of sleep. Instead, I am going to make the center of my life. Jesus has my pleasure. Jesus has my splendor. His presence is my purpose. What would it happen? What would it happen if you went to your boss and you said, look, Mr. Hay, I love this place. I love here. I love you. I love what I am blessed to be a part of. But my church, the third Friday of every month, has got a prayer meeting. And I promise you, it'll be the best thing for you, your business, and my life if I go and be a part of this and come in an hour later. What would that do to your life? What would that do to your witness in the workplace? What kind of intimacy into me you see would you begin to walk in when you tell God, I'm willing to sacrifice sleep. I'm willing to lay down comfort. I'm willing to forsake convenience if it means I can look face to face with Christ. Well, Pastor Matt, I can do that in my own room. I can do that in my living room. I can do that in my bed. I can do that at home. It's convenient. Uh, But my bed is comfort. And all of a sudden we start going, but what about Jesus? What about Jesus? Friends, do you really think the chief desire of my life is to get up at 4 a.m. every single Friday and be here and get here early and put lights and coffee on and, and to do these things? Do you actually believe like in Matt's flesh of flesh, not heart of heart, but my flesh of flesh, that I just live and breathe innately, defaultly, that I want to get up at 4 a.m. on a Friday and be in this room. Flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. And I am telling you, there are things about Jesus that I've only begun to grasp and understand and be found on the cusp of truth of in this room on a Friday. I have learned to fall in love with an empty room because while it may be void of you, it is not absent of him. And I appreciate anybody this morning. Come on, come on. This is what we long for. This is what we bleed for. This is what we are about. It can be void of man. It will not be absent the king. It will be void of women, but it may not be absent the Lord. This is who he is, and he's worth it. I'm telling you, challenge. One Friday morning. That's light work. We're supposed to be Holy Spirit heavyweights here. That's light work. I'm telling you, your life will not just benefit greatly from spending more time in prayer. I am telling you, you as an eternal being will grow in authority. You have been domesticated by West Michigan Church. It is time to get undignified and undomesticated before the throne of heaven. Am I preaching to anybody this morning? Church unleashed. That's where we're going. Come up here, into me. Friday morning, 6 a.m., into me, you see. In to me. Not into you, not into them. 
not into some great self-help chicken noodle soup for your soul Christianity, into me, the one with flames that Ezekiel describes as being fire from the waist down and the waist up. Why the distinction? I have no idea. Ezekiel was a weird guy. But it says that he is an all-consuming fire. And I am telling you, if a bride wants to get close to her husband, she's got to burn to the degree that he burns at. So we're going to keep moving along. We got through one verse. And then he says, he says, come up here and see what must happen after this. See what must happen after this. And what's amazing here is what John sees as the quote unquote, what must happen after this. Can I tell you how amazing this part is? What happens after this? Here's this open heaven, the standing invitation, come my bride, my come, come up here. Before I come back down there, you've got to spend some time up here, get like me, bring it back down to earth and make more people like you. This is the game plan. And so we go up there And what is the first thing to take place in this open heaven? A worship service. A worship service. Friends, can I tell you, there is a time coming when church won't look like this, where there won't be a set time, where there won't be a website for you and I to conveniently go to, to go on there and plan our little visit out. We're thinking about coming to check you out. We're going to try out the house of God and I'm going to review you on Google. You're reviewing the church, his bride. Yeah, Jesus' bride's a six. I dare you to say that about Adrienne. I will piece you up so fast and I will repent so quickly. I promise you. Are you kidding me? I promise. You think I'm violent on the microphone. You wait, wait till my wife's involved. Best part is, she'll probably hit you before I will. It's crazy. Yeah, she's quick with the whip. It's good. She own it. But I'm telling you, first thing we see is a worship service. There's going to come a time, friends, where these stupid emails that we sent, oh, church was too long, and we sang that same song forever, and like it just never ended, and like I had this and that and this and that. Friends, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and it's going quickly. There is a time that will come in this world right now where friends' services will go long beyond two hours, and we will have to be okay with it, and more than okay with it, we will long and desire and thirst for it. You want to know why? Because it will be so cold and so dark and so crazy crazy out there with hysteria and delusions as if it's not already it gets worse trust me read more of the book of revelation it gets worse but a time will come when it's like i'm not ready for this to end i'm not ready to go back out there yet i just want more of him i just want to be around him i just want to keep singing to him i'm gonna spend the next 80 hours of my week out there can we please just have a little more time in here it's been dry I've been hungry. It's been hard. The enemy has tried killing me time and time again. My old co-workers are calling me a homophobe, a xenophobe, a bigot. They are saying I am a cancer in the earth and I just need more time at the foot of Jesus. And so suddenly convenient Christianity won't even be an option. Cultural Christianity won't even exist that bigger boat that we are praying for of our own house, of our own church to call it. It's going to come and the Lord's going to deliver it to us, but it's going to come off the side of a heartbreak when we realize the reason we're receiving this church is because they refuse to stand in the cold, dark night. First thing we see in this moment is a worship service. And it says it's a worship service that goes forever. It doesn't end. Ours started at 10. His started forever ago. It says it goes, and there is a God. He is a man of fire. He is of jasper and carnelian. You know what carnelian is? It is a sunburst red fire. It is a beautiful, precious stone. And this is what John sees, is this red, sunbursting fire of Jesus seated on his throne and around his throne. Oh, man, he has got an emerald rainbow. Like, I knew Jesus was Irish. I just didn't know how Irish. As an Irish guy. I knew it. I didn't know how Irish. He's real in love with that. 
he was like, no, 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 2023, the world is going to steal the rainbow. I'm going to make a green one. It's going to be awesome. Aaron go, brah. He loves it. Israel, bride, Ireland. It's good. It's coming back. But he has an emerald rainbow that surrounds him. I don't even understand that. And then it says there are seven spirits of God and seven torches that are burning around him. Ask me what those are. I have no idea. Some say it speaks to the sevenfold ministry that Jesus holds, which is wild because he only gives us a fivefold. So what are those other two ministries that Jesus has to himself alone running the universe? Keeping us from blowing up inside because we have the Holy Spirit on the inside of us? What are those other two ministries? I have no idea, but I long to find out. I long to find out. And then it says that he is surrounded by 24 other thrones. And under those 24 other thrones is a sea of glass like crystal, and it's beautiful. And on top of those thrones are 24 elders. And those elders, they are in white garments because they have heard, well done and good and faithful servant. And unlike the church in Revelation 3 that soiled themselves, they arrived at the finish line pure and blameless before the Lord. But not only are they dripped, right? That's what the kids are saying, drip, fit, something stupid. I don't get it. Love you, Gen Z. Don't understand a word you said. But they are dripped in white garments and then upon their head, upon their head is a golden crown. And we'll get to that in a second. But then it says, and they are singing. They are singing to the lamb upon the throne. They are singing to the burning one upon the throne. They are singing around a throne of fire and they are in perpetuity forever singing holy, holy, holy as he is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who is and is and is to come. This is what they're singing forever. Matt, why are services so long? I'm trying to get you ready for heaven. <laughs> Why do we sing so long? Because I'm trying to get you ready for heaven. Why do we go so long? Because I don't want for Jesus to wait for you to arrive to have the correct heart posture before him that he's all that matters. He's all that matters. You see, these elders and their crowns, this is an amazing moment. But we'll get back to them because what, what John pivots to next is actually probably really freaky. And they've, they've made an AI video of this. Don't look it up. It'll scare the bejesus out of you. Hello. <sighs> scary and it says there are these four beasts these four creatures that surround him some say creatures some say seraphim some say angels one looks like a man one looks like an ox one looks like a lion and one is like an eagle in flight which I think is a really interesting uh, specification there and I'm curious about that one why he's flying but everyone else is kind of there anyways it's nothing to do with this morning, something I'm digging into personally. But it says that they have wings and that their entire body is covered with eyes. They have eyes in the front, they have eyes in the back. And then as John finishes this description, then he goes, and then I heard they have eyes within. Which is like, oh, I got eyes in the front, I got eyes in the back. And then one of them goes, yeah, we also got eyes inward. And it's like, what? What are you? I'll tell you what they are. They are Jesus' most intimate beings. They are Jesus' most intimate beings. Friends, Jesus, Jesus isn't handcuffed into eternity. He isn't handcuffed onto that throne. He wasn't forced into a room upon him. This wasn't, this wasn't prepared for him. And then he is just indentured servitude to sit on that throne and rule the universe. No, no, no. Jesus had a blank slate when he decided to create the heavens and the earth. Amen. He had a blank slate. And so what he created, he wanted. And what Jesus wants in his room where he created, where he will rule forever is what? People who want to look at him. People who want to view him. People that want nothing more, no other reward than to be found in his presence, basking at his sight, his majesty, his beauty. They can't get enough. See, friends, these creatures, they've got eyes everywhere. Eyes in the front, eyes in the back, and eyes within. 
And yet they forever are found singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. They don't grow tired of looking at Jesus the way you and I grow tired of looking at Jesus. They don't grow tired of singing to Jesus the way you and I grow tired of singing to Jesus. All them eyes and they still can't get their fill of Jesus. What is it about Jesus that these four creatures know that you and I neglect? What is it? What is it about Jesus that these creatures know that you and I neglect? Let's take it a step further. Jesus tells Peter, if they will not praise me, the rocks will cry out before me. Friends, we're talking about rocks. You ever heard the phrase, dumb as a bag of rocks? Maybe that's just in my household. Okay, pray for my parents. They need it. Dumb as a bag of rocks. Listen. Why do people say that? Because rocks are not sentient beings. They have no brains. They have no purpose. They have no goals or ambitions or ideas of their own. They simply exist to be cornerstones to build upon, amen? And yet, Jesus proclaims, if man won't praise me, the rocks will cry out before me. What is it that non-sentient, non-thinking creation that receives no heavenly reward for its faithfulness at the end of its life, what does that know about Jesus that you and I don't know? Four creatures that we can hardly imagine, hardly wrap our heads around. Okay, Matt, I hear you, a lot of eyes, all these things. I've never witnessed one up close, never seen one in person. Like, kind of hard to imagine. Let's take it down to the dumbest common denominator, such as a pebble. When you and I refuse to praise him for simply the fact that he is good, and he is good emphatically and eternally, the rocks will take our place on the tower and they will sound the alarm. The king is coming, the king is coming, the king is coming. When his own bride will not cry out. What is it that creation knows about Jesus that you and I have either intentionally neglected, unintentionally forsaken, or what our forefathers and foremothers refused to pass on to us because it was too costly for them? What is it? What is it? Because friends, we for two hours, we, like Francis Chan said, we just joined in with the worship service of heaven, we will close today and it will continue. And then we will pick back up on Wednesday at Ignite Night at 7 p.m. right here in this very auditorium. And then we will end that. And then we will pick back up Friday morning at 6 a.m. And then we will end that. And then we will pick back up 10 a.m. and into perpetuity. This is what we do. But this is a worship service that is continuing. And Jesus had a blank slate when he created creation. And what did he choose to surround himself with? The ones who desire the most intimacy with him. You ever covet somebody else's knowledge? You ever covet somebody else's wisdom? You ever covet somebody else's revelation? You ever ever coveted somebody else's spiritual giftings and Holy Spirit life and how they're just able to be so disciplined and given over to the things of God? You ever sat there and gone, man, I wish I could be more like so-and-so. They're just so powerful in the spirit. What if we stopped coveting what other people are beholding and we started beholding the thing other people have been beholding. Friends, you become what you behold. Not only do you become what you behold, you become like what you behold. You become what you behold. Why are these things with eyes everywhere, inward, outward, and around, why are they so committed to singing the same song to the same king for eternity? Because they long to become like that which they behold. We just want to be like this man. He is fire. And yet has hands that have been torn on Calvary. Has a tattoo on his thigh that says Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And he rules in equal parts justice and kindness and mercy and grace. He is omnipotent and yet he desires to dwell somewhere. He is both above and he's within. Who is this Jesus? He is Christ Emmanuel with us and then he's Holy Spirit Christ within us. Who is this Jesus? Friends, you will become that which you behold. And I fear in the church today, in our very church, bring it to our front door, in our very church, some of us 
have been trying, striving, attempting, and failing at being more like Jesus because we've been beholding other things. I just want to be like Matt. Don't be like Matt. Be like Jesus. I just want to preach like Matt. Don't preach like Matt. Preach like Jesus. I just want to pray like Adrian. Don't pray like Adrian. Pray like Jesus. Are you kidding me? Stop. For the love of Jesus, I implore you today, stop trying to covet someone else's oil and go to Jesus and purchase your own. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, whatever is on my life is only beneficial to your life to the degree of which it provokes you to go up here, to come up here. That's the only benefit it has. I thank God I am who I am and I thank God I'm not who other people wish I was. But don't wish you were me and don't wish you were another preacher or another pastor or another Christian. Jesus has a place and a sight for you to behold of him in his throne room around an emerald rainbow among a sea of crystals. But it's for you and you alone. You see, the thing about those beings, those creatures, those seraphim, the man, the eagle, and the ox, and all the stuff, the thing about them is they all had these very different distinctions, but the one commonality is that they were obsessed with Jesus. They couldn't get enough. No amount of eyes would satiate and fill the hunger and thirst that they have for that man, and yet here you and I are in America in 2023, where church once a month is satiating enough, praying once a day is satiating enough, spending one moment in the word is satiating enough, going to one meeting a month is satiating enough. And I am telling you, what we have spoiled our appetite on this side of heaven will pale in comparison to the table of the Lord at the banquet dinner of the marriage of the bridegroom Jesus. Worship team, you can make your way up here. So I said we were going to talk about the crowns. You see, most Christians, we live a consumeristic life instead of a come up here life. We live a consumeristic Christianity instead of a come up here Christianity. We have a consumeristic relationship with Jesus instead of a come up here relationship with Jesus. And, and it's a problem and it grieves me deeply because here are these elders and these elders are dipped in white garments and they have this golden crown upon their head. And it says that this golden crown sits upon their head, but as it sits upon their head, they take that golden crown from their head and they cast it. They cast it. They throw it down willingly, violently. They don't spare any expense. They don't put it down because it's precious. They don't pull a pillow out and lay it before Jesus as a, as a good and pleasing offering. No, they take that crown and all it's worth and they cast it down at his throne. Well, Pastor Matt, why is this important? Because that very crown was given to them by Jesus. That crown that the book of Revelation speaks about all the time, that Jesus gives every single one of us, this crown, it is the sum total of our life. Faithfulness and unfaithfulness alike, it is the mantle that has been placed upon your head. It is your purpose, it's your destiny. It's your good gifts, it's your treasures. It's your family, it's your kids. It's your jobs, it's the money you've accrued, it's how you've spent, it's how you steward it, it's how you've lived your life. The sum total of your life lived out before God is shaped and fashioned into a crown upon your head that you will then place at the feet of Jesus. Friends, I wanna tell you today that every good and perfect gift comes from the Father that every good and perfect gift that you and I have in this life, everything that he has given us, your calling, your purpose, your destiny is a blood-bought treasure given to you by heaven. It is a blood-bought treasure that was bestowed upon you, placed upon you, given to you, entrusted to you to guard and to grow, to guard and to grow, to guard and to grow, not just manage, but multiply, not just manage, but multiply, not just manage, but multiply. 
Friends, Jesus, he allows us to live this life unto his glory. And then he allows us to wear a crown of well done, good and faithful servant. And then we find ourselves in his presence. And because we view him rightly, we respond correctly. And our only good and right response to a good and right God is to take all that he gave us, all that he entrusted with us, all that he gave us to do, every assignment, every gift, everything we did not deserve, nor could we ever ask for, and yet he still showed faithful to it. We take that crown and we don't count, we don't count the cost. We don't count the loss. We don't look at it with the good old days in mind. We don't even think about everything, blood, sweat, and tears, sacrifice, heartbreak that went into this crown. No, we look at him rightly and we respond correctly and we worship him perfectly and we throw it down. We throw it down because no matter the crown and no matter the worth found, he is worthy all the more. Would you stand? Would you stand? Would you stand? See, friends, when we begin to see Jesus rightly, we will worship him correctly. And when we worship him correctly, it is worship perfectly. It is perfectly. He's given us this crown and yet willingly, willfully, we cast it down. It doesn't matter the value of it or the value found in it. He is worthy all the more. And so we don't worry about what happens to that crown when we cast it on the floor. That goal breaks, shatters, blows apart on the crystal glass that surrounds his throne. And in it, a beautiful fragrance, a beautiful perfume, a life poured out before his feet is found good and pleasing in his sight, a pleasing aroma unto the Lord on his throne. And we join in with a chorus of elders and we sing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty that all that he willed was created and by his will all was created. And it says that the elders, they approach Jesus with all glory, all honor, and all power. I don't want to live this life, this side of heaven, attempting to just give Jesus more of my sin. I want to live a life where I have killed my sin and what I have to give him is all honor, is all glory, and is all power. Amen. Notice the 24 elders, they didn't say all glory, all honor, all pornography, all glory, all honor, all sexual immorality, all glory, all thievery, all lies and power. No, no, no. It was good. It is pleasing. It is what he desires. And I believe today there is a way, this side of heaven, empowered by the Holy Spirit and in submission to the Word of God, that you and I, we can begin to live this life. But friends, I am telling you, the only way to live before a throne of fire is to live upon the altar. Would you kill the lights? We're going to sing. This is how we end every service if you're new with us. We're going to sing a song called On the Altar. And I invite you right now, don't wait for me to be done. I invite you right now, come and take your place at the altar. If you want to begin a life today, 
of into me you see intimacy, of into me you see intimacy. If you want to accept the invitation of Lord Jesus to come up here, don't wait for yourself to be alone. He's already in the room. The door is already open. The ladder has descended. He is ready for you to come up here. So don't wait for me to be done. Don't wait for me to finish. If you want to come and find yourself at the altar and coming up here, and you want to look upon the one who still has scars in his hand, yet is fully ascended and fully in heaven, and yet fully willing and able to come and meet with you and profoundly change you for eternity even now, then come down here so that we can come up here. And I'm going to pray and we're going to worship. Father God, right now, even under the sound of my voice, I pray that you would just begin to disturb these people. I, begin, I pray, God, that you would disturb me. I pray, God, that right now, Lord, there would be such a yearning and a turning on the inside of me right now, Lord, that I just want to buckle at my knees because I just want more of you, God. Every other fount that I've run to this week, God, I repent of. God, every other fountain we've gone and drink from this week, we repent of, God. Every other well that we put a bucket down, but it still came up dry. And if it came up with any water, it came back salt water. God, I repent, Lord. I repent, Lord. Salt water that just left me more thirsty empty wells that just left me more dry. Things, God, that I tried to go to for my nourishment, for my love, for my satiation, God. I lay it down. I repent. And Lord, I say, I acknowledge that door is still open before me because you have never closed it on me. Lord, call to me and I will come up here. Lord, call to me and I will come up here. Lord, call to me and I will walk up here. God, I will live my life upon the altar in front of a burning throne, a throne of fire that pierces through me, that burns within me, and God, that leaves me in without impurity and good and pleasing and faithful in your sight, oh Lord. So come, Lord, have your way in this place, have your way in this people, have your way this morning. And may we join in with the worship service in heaven just a little bit longer. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. In Jesus' name, come to the altar. Worship team, would you sing amen, 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 Lord Jesus.